Well, good evening, friends. How wonderful to be in fellowship with you again. It's been a month, and I've missed you during this time. We gather in this season of remembering Jesus' death and resurrection. And may we remain in prayer and thanksgiving for Christ's supreme sacrifice and gift of salvation, and in praise and celebration of the triumphant Christ in his glorious resurrection. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, our hearts burning grief and sadness for the cruelty that led you through Christ to the unimaginable suffering in the crucifixion but also our joy soars to the highest level in your power over all, including death, that brought new life in Christ's resurrection and offers us new life and salvation. May your love be so indelibly marked in our minds that we will perform every deed, say every word that brings honor to you. We thank you in ways that words cannot describe. We thank you for bringing Gene a third time. May every word he speaks be inspired by you. And may each of us, in turn, be faithful to his teaching, that it would be your teaching through him. And to Christ be all glory in honor. Amen. So we are gratified to have Gene Pickard with us again this evening, his third class on Quaker faith and practice. Gene is a true friend in the spirit of Jesus said, who said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And he does what Jesus commands us because he loves God and he loves his neighbor. His academic background, as you may recall, was a bachelor's degree from here at Berkeley College. His master of divinity degree from Asbury Theological Seminary. His doctor of missiology, that's doctor of missions from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He loves the church. The Friends Church has been his spiritual heritage all of his life. He's a family man. In fact, I saw him today at lunch with his lovely wife, Myra. He has two children, Heather Hayes, who works here at Barclay College, and Jason Pickard, who lives in Oklahoma. And if you don't find Gene here, you may find him in Oklahoma with his grandchildren. So often we'll see Gene in fellowship with Heather at Barclay College. I cherish my friendship with Gene, a friend of many, many years. And Gene, we're grateful for your teaching us for the third time, a, a time of rich gathering and fellowship. God bless you as you teach us. Okay. All right. It's good to be with you again this evening. Last time we were together, we began to talk about the Quaker view of Christian perfection, and we're going to continue that theme. Let me change my angle here a little bit. There. We're going to continue that theme this evening, and then we'll go into some other themes as well before we finish tonight. Um, 
Last time when we begin to talk about Christian perfection, we noted that the reformers uh, opposing the Catholic view of merit strongly emphasized justification by faith, but they were actually weak on the doctrine of sanctification. One author says, the reformers restored the idea of justification by faith, but were weak in their, in their doctrine of sanctification. If justification was the apple of their eye, sanctification was their blind spot. And so uh, when the uh, Quakers came along about 100 years later after, after the Re Reformation began, a little over 100 years later, they strongly emphasized perfection. And I've noted this already a couple of times. Uh, George Fox emphasized perfection to the point where he, he thought we could become as perfect as Adam before the fall. I have my doubts about that, but anyway, that's uh, the way the movement that they had. Another thing that I'll just remind you of is that the Quakers tended to mix the idea of justification with sanctification. So when they talked about justification, it wasn't for them just being declared righteous in God's sight or pardon, it was also being transformed and becoming righteous in our, in our minds and, and our spiritual lives. So uh, we also noted that the Calvinists, for them, salvation was acceptance by God from our sins, but it was not salvation from sin in this life, and the Quakers rejected that idea. So, uh, you know, thinking about some of the uh, perhaps negative things I've said about Calvinism, or I'm mostly quoting Barclay, but uh, I'm not real high on at least extreme Calvinism myself. Uh, one of my students gave me something a few years ago that I thought I would share with you. It's not directly related to Friends Doctrine, but, but anyway, it's interesting. It's entitled The Pit. It goes like this. A man fell into a pit, and he couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. An objective person came along and said, well, it's logical that someone would fall down there. A Christian scientist came along and said, you only think you're in that pit. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into pits. A mathematician calculated how he fell into the pit. A news reporter wanted an exclusive story on his pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve your pit. A Calvinist said, if you'd been saved, you'd never fallen in that pit. A Wesleyan said, you were saved, and you still fell in that pit. A Charismatic said, just confess that you're not in that pit. A Realist came along and said, now that's a pit. The Geologist told him to appreciate the rock strat in the pit. An IRS man asked if he was paying taxes on his pit. A county inspector asked if he had a permit to dig the pit. An evasive person came along and avoided the subject altogether. A self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. An optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist said, things will get worse. Jesus, seeing the man, reached down and took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. <laughs> well, the Quaker didn't come into that one. Probably should find a way to include him. I did. I did tell you though about uh, Robert Barclay had an illustration about the pit, in which uh, he, he he described it this way: All humanity is in a pit, and they're insensible to their danger and their condition. And then he noted that uh, the the Calvinists. Uh, would say that God reached down and selected certain ones and took them out of the pit. And uh, the Arminians uh, said that God would build a ladder and uh, wake them up and give them the means of getting out of the pit. Whereas the Quakers' position was that God actually reaches down and puts everyone in his hand. And unless those people jump out of his hand or decide that they don't want to get out of the pit, then they're saved. So it's a little bit different than uh, what our position usually is today. And we usually expect children and adults to make a declaration of faith, whereas apparently the, uh, the uh, early Quakers had the idea that you were already saved unless you rejected God. So it wasn't universalism. 
Um, it uh, it does lend itself well to the to the uh, salvation of infants. So uh, to a certain extent, I like that idea. Well, let's move on. Here we talked last time about uh, the possibility of at least living above known sin, at least living beyond rebellion, and uh, turning our backs on God. That's uh, been the Quaker way. Um, Elton Trueblood said, if the grace of God does not, in fact, give power to overcome sin, it is really an empty phrase. And so we, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, perfection. If you have your PowerPoints in front of you, we're looking at the second one that Dave sent out, and we're going to begin with number nine, if you need to look that up. It's the one uh, from March. Right, it's the one from March we dealt with. So here you have it on your screen. Joseph John, Gurley had, Joseph John Gurney had a tremendous influence on Quakers in the 19th century. The early 19th century, he was uh, uh, he's a, uh, a Brit, United Kingdom, born into a very wealthy family, a banking family, and very much influenced by the evangelical movement in Great Britain in his time. In fact, he almost left the Quakers and, and joined with the other evangelicals, but decided that he would stay with his heritage. But he got very involved in uh, Bible studies. He got very involved in the Bible societies. When he made a trip to the United States, he introduced Bible studies, and he introduced the, the heresy of actually preparing your sermons ahead of time instead of just waiting on the Spirit to give you something to say when you came into the worship service. That caused a division with John Wilbur. John Wilbur was very traditional, conservative in his methods. And so there was a second division among Quakers between what's called the Gurneyites, following Joseph John Gurney, and the Wilburites, who followed John Wilbur. Most of the Orthodox or uh, Evangelical Quakers followed in Gurney's footsteps. And it wasn't yet, uh, it didn't yet become program meetings, but uh, Gurney really, in his teachings, uh, opened the door to that kind of um, meeting. Gurney was also the one that really introduced what's called the second work of grace into the uh, uh, Quaker theology. Uh, some of you might not be familiar when we talk about second work of grace, exactly what we're talking about. Wesleyanism, Wesley Methodism, uh, John Wesley, and uh, those that followed him talked about a second work after the work of justification. After the initial work of coming to Christ and faith, then typically a person uh, would have a second work of grace in which there would be a cleansing or a deepening. Now, uh, Wesley never called it the baptism of the Spirit, but uh, some of his followers after that, Fletcher and others, uh, Adam Clark, uh, referred to the baptism of the Spirit as a second work of grace after one is converted. And to a certain extent, uh, in fact, most of the Wesleyans that followed him, him and uh, the Nazarenes and others who follow Wesleyanism today uh, sometimes insist uh, that a person has to have a second work of grace. Some have gone to the extreme of actually saying that you're not really totally saved until you have that baptism of the Spirit that follows the initial, initial conversion experience. I don't think Bernie went quite that far, but he did introduce the idea of a second work of grace into uh, uh, Quaker theology. And so the Wesleyans had camp meetings, holiness camp meetings, all across the United States. And a lot of our young Quaker, our young people begin to attend those Quaker meetings, or those uh, holiness camp meetings. Uh, things in the Quaker church were pretty quiet. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to watch the uh, Friendly Persuasion, a movie entitled The Friendly Persuasion, that takes place setting is during the Civil War in the United States. But uh, when on a Sunday morning, a, a Quaker and his his preacher wife are driving to church with their horse and buggy, and they stop, of course, at the Quaker meeting house, and then his friend, who he happens to be racing to church, by the way, a Methodist guy goes to the Methodist church. And so then it pans the Methodist church and they're singing heartily, they're singing a hymn. And in the uh, Quaker meeting house, they're sitting in silence. Nobody's speaking at the beginning anyway. So it shows that difference. So 
the things are pretty quiet. In fact, Hannah Whitehouse Smith says in her autobiography that many in her circles, in the Friends Church, Quakers, had never heard the plan of salvation. Seldom ever read the Bible. Many of them didn't even have a Bible in their home at that time. By the way, uh, Hannah Whitehall Smith wrote a, a book that's still a Christian classic. It's entitled Christian Secret of a Happy Life, in which she describes a life of holiness, written in the late 1800s. If you have a chance to read that, it's well worth the read. So, the emphasis began on a second work of grace. A few years ago, I was asked to give a series of lectures at Azusa Pacific University in their seminary. So I did three lectures. The first lecture I entitled, uh, As Perfect as Adam Before the Fall, uh, introducing and explaining the early Quakers' understanding of, of Christian perfection. The second lecture I entitled, John Wesley Meets George Fox. Now, of course, John Wesley and George Fox never met because John Wesley lived about 100 years after George Fox. But what I meant by that was how the Quakers became involved in the Wesleyan movement. And in part, it was due to, jo to Joseph John Gurney's emphasis on holiness. But in large part, it was because many of the young people in the uh, Friends churches began to attend these holiness camp meetings. And there was a spiritual revival among these young people. They, be, uh, they begin to come back to their own meetings. Uh, they want to sing songs now. They're enamored with, with the music at these camp meetings. And uh, they've come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so many of the Orthodox Quakers entered into the Wesleyan movement at that time in the mid-19th century. And the revival broke out in the Friends churches. In Indiana, there were several thousand that were added to membership over a period of 10 to 20 years because of these uh, holiness camp meetings and, and young people from the Friends Church of getting involved in them. Uh, one of the pastors by the name of David Updegraff insisted that the baptism of the Holy Spirit as it identified with the second work of grace subsequent to salvation. I've done a study through the book of Acts and I personally disagree with them. If anyone's interested in that study, I can send it to them. I think that the uh, uh, the terminology is so mixed, it seems to me when you look at the book of Acts that receiving the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit are all synonymous in the book of Acts. And uh, so I don't think it necessarily was the second work of grace. But David Updegraff insisted that it was. And uh, in fact, he said that... Uh, much evil flows out of the teaching that the baptism of the Holy Spirit marks our initiation into the kingdom of God. So he follows Fletcher in that concept. Fletcher was a Wesleyan writer after John Wesley. Sanctification, the idea of sanctification has changed through the years. In fact, we don't actually hear it talked about that much anymore. I have a, with me here... Uh, I guess you can't see it really. I have a small booklet entitled A History of the Doctrine of Sanctification Among Evangelical Friends from George Fox to the Present Time, written by Philip E. Taylor, who's a Brit who came to the United States and was uh, working in the Eastern region. And this is part, at least, of his uh, master's thesis. Very interesting. Uh, when you read through that history, you find different statements. Uh, at least I find no longer statements talking about the second work of grace, but friends still do emphasize the idea of sanctification. Let me read from Taylor's book here what he says about sanctification. Sanctification, we believe, sanctification, we believe that the children of God at the time of their conversion received the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to pause there for just a minute. I had a controversy with our superintendent in Guatemala while we were there because he was taught, or at least he thought he was taught, that when we become Christians at our conversion experience, we receive Jesus as our Savior, but we don't receive the Holy Spirit until we have a subsequent or second work of grace. And that's when we receive the Holy Spirit. So let me read that first line again. We believe that the children of God at the time of their conversion receive the Holy Spirit. I agree with that statement. Uh, it uh, says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, if we do not have the Spirit, we do not have Christ. 
And so there are other scriptures that I could cite as well. But anyway, I don't believe that the second work of grace is a receiving of the Holy Spirit. And John Wesley never used that terminology either. Let me go on here. As they trust in him and obey his will, they manifest more and more the fruit of the Spirit and conform more and more to the likeness of God and thus are continually, continuously sanctified. So notice that's an emphasis on the process of sanctification rather than some immediate work as a second work of grace that sanctifies us. It is also the will of God that believers receive the fullness of the Spirit, which he will graciously grant uh, um, in response to their full consecration to his will and their faith in his atoning death. So you see there, they're distinguishing in this statement of faith, they're distinguishing between receiving the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I think it, it would be worthwhile to do a little clarification because uh, traditionally, in fact, in the way that I was taught growing up, receiving the Holy Spirit and fullness of the Holy Spirit is one and the same. And sometimes the impression has been given in holiness teaching that uh, God, some to a certain extent, withholds his spirit from us. And then when we talk about the fullness of the spirit, then we get the whole spirit. The problem with that is you can't divide the spirit. The spirit is indivisible. You can't get part of the spirit at one point and get the rest of the spirit at another point. Now, in his wonderful little book, The Spirit of Holiness, Everett Cattell um, explains the fullness of the spirit in this way. We don't get more of the spirit. The spirit gets more of us. And that's the fullness of the spirit. And he uses an illustration that I, I like a lot and I've used it in different cases. He was a missionary in India for a while. And uh, once a year, they would clear everything out of the house and clean the house. I said, well, all the furniture was in the house and the sun shining through the window, there are shadows in the room. But once all the furniture is removed, there are no more shadows. So the question is, is there more sun when the furniture is removed? Or are there just less obstacles to the sun shining everywhere? There are less obstacles. That's the fullness of the Spirit. When we give ourselves over to Spirit in total consecration to Him. So going on here, sanctification is thus a process in which the Holy Spirit continuously disciplines the believer in the path of holiness and an act in which He cleanses the heart from an imperfect relationship and state. We further believe that the fullness of the Spirit does not make believers incapable of choosing sin. Now, Barclay and the early Quakers also said that as well. That doesn't make us incapable of choosing sin, nor even from completely falling away from God, yet it so cleanses and empowers them as to enable them to have victory over sin, to endeavor fully to love God and man and to witness to the living Christ. That's from the faith and practice in uh, 1987. Southwest, you're meeting statement of faith says the following about uh, sanctification. We believe that the Holy Spirit will lead those who believe in the Lord Jesus into transformed lives. This radical and divinely empowered transformation happens as we come to see Jesus more clearly, know him more intimately, and follow him more closely. This life is marked by increasing conformity to Christ, good, Christ's goodness and holiness as we die to our own sin and self-seeking we believe this transformation is accomplished through obedience and self-denial by the believer and empowered and, uh, and the empowerment and cleansing by the Holy Spirit. So that's their understanding of sanctification. I'm sorry I didn't get that on the screen for you before. Uh, again, you don't see any, any uh, talking here about a second work of grace now, but there still is that transformation. There still is the emphasis on being conformed to the image of Christ, being transformed in a relationship to him, and note that it's not the result of any meritorious action on our part, but it's the empowering of the Holy Spirit that enables us to live a life above sin. So, even some of the uh, non-holiness people will often talk about a second, some kind of a second experience in the life of the Christian. If you're familiar at all with Bill Bright's uh, uh, the uh, Four Spiritual Laws and some of his, uh, his drawings. Uh, in, in one of his pamphlets, he draws a circle and he says, this represents the Christian's life. There's a throne in that circle. 
and the eye is on the throne. And Jesus is outside the circle. The life is all scattered. It's not in any kind of uh, uh, order, orderly arrangement. When we invite Jesus into our life, he comes in, but we often do not allow him on the throne. Rather, we allow him in our lives. And then he said, when we recognize that, and so he's actually talking about a second experience. When we recognize that and we take ourselves off the throne and we allow Jesus to be on the throne, that's when we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Very much like some of the modern Quaker doctrine of the uh, of sanctification. <clears throat> There's a, a wonderful little booklet entitled My Heart, Christ's Home. And in that little booklet, it tells about a man who invited Jesus into his life, into his home. He, he illustrates it as a home. And when Jesus comes in his home to live, then Jesus goes with him through the home, cleansing out things that ought not to be in that home. He goes through his library and cleanses out things that shouldn't be in his library. He goes through his kitchen and cleanses out things that shouldn't be part of his appetite and so on. And he talks about the wonderful fellowship that he has with Jesus in his home. But then things begin to grow a little cool in his relationship with Jesus. And one day, Jesus comes from his room upstairs, comes down and says, there's a closet up there that needs to be taken out. It stinks. And the man said, I became annoyed. And I told him, I've given you the whole house to live in. That closet is for me. That's mine. And Jesus tells him, I can't live here with that stench. And so the man said, Jesus, I don't want you to leave. I want you to live here. I can't clean it out. Here's the key to it. You clean it out. And furthermore, I don't want you to just live in this house. I'm going to give you the title to the house. So that's what we're talking about. And we're talking about sanctification, cleansing out everything, allowing Jesus to cleanse out everything that's, that's not according to his will and actually giving him the title to our life so that he owns us in that way. The, uh, uh, there are carnal Christians. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you'll find there uh, described very briefly three, three uh, different spiritual conditions. Paul talks there about the spiritual person. He talks about the natural person, the natural man or the natural person. And he talks about the carnal person. That goes into chapter 3, actually. The spiritual person has discernment. The spiritual person allows himself to be judged and, and uh, uh, motivated by Jesus. The natural person has no discernment. In fact, he thinks spiritual things are foolish things. But then Paul goes on in chapter 3 to describe the carnal person who apparently is a, a Christian because he calls them brothers. And he says, but they're still carnal. There are divisions among them and there are jealousies and this and that. And unfortunately, we often see this kind of behavior in our churches uh, with people that are not fully committed to Jesus Christ. J. Robertson McQuilkin, in his uh, chapter on the, uh, the five views of holiness, describes that person this way. He calls them a mediocre Christian. Church members, and he's describing the mediocre Christian here, Church members typically think and behave very much like the morally upright non-Christians. They are decent enough, but there's nothing supernatural about them. Their behavior is quite explainable in terms of heredity, early environment, and present circumstances. They yield to temptation and more often than not, lusting when their body demands it, covering what they do, coveting what they do not have and taking credit for their accomplishments. The touchstone of their choices is self-interest, and though they have a love for God and others, it does not control their life. There is little change for the better. In fact, most church members do not exchange and do not expect much improvement and are little concerned by that prospect. Scripture is not exciting. Prayer is perfunctory. And service in the church demonstrates little touch of the supernatural. Above all, their life seems to have an empty core, for it does not center around a constant personal relationship with the Lord. Now, he's describing here a Christian, but it's a carnal Christian, or as he calls it, a mediocre Christian. And unfortunately, we find, in fact, he call, says that the uh, church members are typically, and I think that seems to imply that the majority 
of Christians are in that category. I hope that's not true, but uh, it often is. Um, he goes on to uh, describe what he calls the normal Christian. I would use the term mature Christian, or if you want to use the term sanctified Christian, that's fine. He describes the normal Christian in this way. The normal Christian is characterized by loving responses to ingratitude and indifference, even hostility, and is filled with joy in the midst of unhappy circumstances and with, and with, with peace when everything goes wrong. The normal Christian overcomes in the battle with temptation, consistently obeys the laws of God, and grows in self-control, contentment, humility, and courage. Thought processes are so under the control of the Holy Spirit and instructed by the scripture that the normal Christian authentically reflects the attitudes and behavior of Jesus Christ. God has first place in his life, and the welfare of others takes precedence over personal desires. The normal Christian has power not only for godly living, but for effective service in the church. Above all, he or she has the joy of constant companionship with the Lord. Now that's the way it ought to be. And that's the way that Quakers have always believed that it can be. D. Elton Trueblood spoke of the paradox of perfection. He said, perhaps the last thing to say about perfection is the paradox, that it's wrong to claim it, and it's equally wrong to deny its possibility. To claim it is to be guilty of self-delusion and also the sin of pride, while to deny its possibility is to limit God's power. Now, this is a paradox, isn't it? Again, I think that the possibility of living above sin is a possibility open to all of us if we commit ourselves to Jesus Christ in uh, full sacrifice to him. Now, I'm not going to read the next statement of faith here, from, uh, again, from Evangelical Friends Church Southwest. You have it on your papers there if you uh, have those in front of you. So, the Quakers in the 17th, 19th, and 20th centuries were right. God expects us to be morally responsible. He expects us to live a life of sanctity, and he empowers us to do it. I like this little poem. I don't know who wrote it. F.F. Uh, Bruce quotes it in his Hard Sayings of Jesus. It goes like this. To run and work the law commands, yet gives me neither feet nor hands. The better news the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. That has always been and remains the Quaker message. <laughs> Maybe I should uh, pause here and ask if there are any questions about this topic before we go to the to the next one. And meanwhile, I'm sure somebody has a question about being able to live in perfection. I need to get to the other PowerPoint. I don't want to do that. No, I'll do it. Too. Okay. Does some does someone have a question about being able to live in perfection? Except one. No, no, we need to go to. Uh, Should be 51. Oh. Seven. No, I'm sorry. I need to go back to the other one. Because I have the rest of my PowerPoint on that one, on the on program meeting. Yeah, go back to the. I think we're. Go back to the other one. Yeah. All right. To the other PowerPoint. Yes, I know. I had to get it. Marks in there. Okay. Now that's who you were. Yeah, but I need to go on with that one. I got a little mixed up here. Sorry, folks, I had a little mixed up in my order here. I did forget to mention one thing, <laughs> one statement that I like. Somebody said that the, the Methodists put crosses on top of their church to emphasize the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Presbyterians put weather vanes on top of their churches to show that, they're, uh, that they turn with every wind of doctrine. The Quakers put lightning rods on top of their churches to show that the fire of God once fell on them and they want to see that it never happens again. <laughs> and again, I hope that's not true. 
Okay, we're going to go into the next topic, friends' view of worship. And we'll spend some time on this. As we've already stated earlier, the early friends did not have programmed worship. They had no pastors. They, uh, they did often have preaching in their worship services, but it wasn't planned ahead of time. And often the person that preached didn't plan their sermon ahead of time. They waited for the inward moving of the Holy Spirit to move them to speak. So that sometimes uh, Quakers are referred to as silent friends. Those who have unprogrammed meetings in our day and age will often sit for an hour or more in silence with no one speaking. I, I don't believe that the early friends could be categorized or described as silent because their, their meetings typically were, uh, though unprogrammed, were full of people exhorting or singing or giving testimony or prayer and so on. That's unprogrammed worship. Now, the, the Orthodox friends, the followers of Gurney in uh, our day and age, evangelical friends, typically do not practice unprogrammed worship services as a whole. But many of us still, uh, still have a part of our worship service as unprogrammed worship in which we allow people when we come together in our worship services to share in a period of time. Uh, that's, it has different terminologies and so on, but, but uh, what the early Quakers stressed was that true worship is inward. It's moving and it's uh, a movement by God's spirit. It's not limited to places, to time, persons. It doesn't have to be limited to a Sunday morning, a Sunday evening. In fact, the early Quakers didn't believe that one day of the week was any more holy than any other day of the week. Sunday was a convenient time for everyone to get together, give people a break from their work, including their animals and the servants and so on. And so they met, as did other Christians, on Sunday, which they called the first day of the week. And so when the saints came together, they didn't set up a particular person to preach or pray and they didn't exclude the participation of others so that anyone who was led by the Spirit of God had the opportunity to speak in the worship service. So again, the first day of the week wasn't more holy than anywhere else. Uh, the meeting house was not any more holy than any place else. In fact, they didn't call them churches. They called them meeting houses because that's where they met together. So it was just simply a place of meeting, not some sanctuary or temple. Nor did they practice silence for silence sake. As I've already said, there were very few meetings probably that were totally silent. So it's not silence that we've sought to cultivate through the years, but the spiritual quality of stillness. As the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. And that's what they were searching for, that stillness before God, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to them and listening to the Holy Spirit as he spoke to them. Quaker worship doesn't depend on any outward thing, uh, preaching, sacraments, Bible, and so on. If those things aren't present, worship can still proceed. Now, we do tend to emphasize the Bible in our worship services now, where the early Quakers didn't so much. In fact, again, uh, talking about Hannah Whitehall Smith, said that they had seldom heard the Bible read in her worship services. She was among the unprogrammed in the uh, late 19th century. D. Elton Trueblood said on one occasion, isn't it curious that the Holy Spirit inspires one person 52 times a year and all the other people in the congregation he doesn't seem to inspire at all. <laughs> but by allowing unprogrammed time in our worship service, we do allow the Holy Spirit to inspire others to speak. So the, uh, uh, we usually typically, one thing that I've always appreciated about the Havilland Friends Church is that they typically do have a time when program meeting, sometimes called by different, uh, by different terminology, uh, communion after the manner of friends or time of open worship and so on. I'm back in Havilland now, so I get to enjoy that again. For the last 30 some odd years, I haven't enjoyed enjoyed that because it was not a practice in Guatemala. Part of the uh, reason for that, it was a fairly large church 
And when someone would take the mic, they tended to go on and on and on and not want to give up the mic. So they just didn't open it up to everyone. And then I found that in the church where I worshiped in California, again, a large congregation, I, I think there was that fear too that uh, if they opened up uh, for open worship, then, then they would lose the whole control of the service. So I didn't enjoy open worship there either. There, we had a uh, we had an Irish friend come over, visit us, uh, an unprogrammed meeting in Ireland, and he rather mocked us, um, talking about the millisecond of silence that we practice in our open worship services, <clears throat> which was true actually at the time. So in our current practice. Most program worship services have built in time of silence. And uh, everything surrounding open worship time is meant to lead us into direct encounter with God and actually allows other people to feel the moving of the Spirit, uh, to, to uh, give a word of, of encouragement, a word of exhortation, uh, a testimony, a prayer, a song, and so on, which can be a great blessing to the congregation as a whole. The traditional form of worship has been preserved in the liberal Quaker uh, branch of Quakerism, that is to say, unprogrammed meetings. But uh, as John Punchin said, there's no corporate commitment to Jesus Christ in those unprogrammed meetings. It's interesting to meet uh, someone from an unprogrammed meeting who happens to visit a program meeting and uh, and I've often, the ones that I've met have said, I've never been in a program meeting. And so, and I've personally never been in a totally unprogrammed meeting, although I've said, gone through parts of an unprogrammed meeting. Several years ago when I was in Guatemala, the uh, uh, FWCC, Friends World Committee for Consultation, had a small group meeting in Chiquimula, Guatemala, where we ministered. And some leaders from different uh, uh, different areas came to, to that. One of the uh, men that came to that meeting stayed with us in our home. We hosted that person with us. I don't remember his name, and I probably wouldn't say it anyway if I did. He was a professor at Haverford College in Pennsylvania and a member of an unprogrammed meeting. To my surprise, I found in, in getting to know him that he had grown up in California in program meetings, his father had actually planted a church or two, and his father was a pastor in program meetings in California. And so out of curiosity, I asked him, well, having grown up in program meeting and now in an unprogram meeting, which do you prefer? His response was, oh, I think program meetings are an abomination. And I was taken aback by that. I said, why? He said, well, because in a program meeting, they expect the pastor to do everything. They expect the pastor to, to visit. They expect the pastor to do the preaching and the teaching. Uh, they expect the pastor to come up with new ideas and vision. And the rest of the congregation seems to have no responsibility. Whereas in an unprogrammed meeting, everyone is responsible to do those kinds of things. So I thought, well, point well taken. I still prefer the program meetings. But, and he still thinks they're an abomination. But anyway, uh, I do enjoy I do enjoy very much that period of time in our worship service where we have the opportunity to participate and share with one another in uh, unprogrammed time. Um, some of you may not practice that. Some of you are non-Quakers, so you perhaps don't do that as well. Uh, but it is a for me. It's a part of my heritage and something that I enjoy very much. So to go on talking about our worship, let's take a view at the a short view. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about the friends view of the sacraments. Friends traditionally have not practiced the sacraments. They've not practiced uh, communion with the elements, nor have they practiced baptism with water. They do believe in baptism with the Holy Spirit and I stress that that is the one essential baptism that with the Holy Spirit. If you go to Ephesians chapter four, uh, Paul says that there is one faith, one uh, Lord, one baptism. And so the friends have traditionally believed that that one baptism or that essential baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Friends have rejected.
the belief that Christ actually instituted two specific ceremonies, which are essential for salvation. And in response to those who uh, do believe that Christ instituted two specific ceremonies, that, which are essential, often friends have asked different questions about that. Uh, you will note, if you read church history, and, and you don't even have to read church history to note this, that there are great divisions about how those sacraments are to be administered. For instance, uh, when it comes to baptism, should we practice infant baptism or pedo baptism? Should it be conversion baptism? Uh, should we demand baptism with water as an initiation into a church? Who are the ones responsible for that? Uh, uh, at what point does a person become baptized? Is it to be done by pouring, by sprinkling, by immersion, and so on? So all of these have caused great controversy among churches and Christians throughout the years. When we talk about communion with the elements, there are also a lot of divisions and difference of opinion concerning those. Who are the ones that are ordained or responsible or uh, allowed to bless the elements? Uh, what constitutes the elements? Does it have to be unleavened bread? Can it be leavened bread? Is it to be open communion so that anyone could participate or should it be closed communion only for those who are believers or only those who are members of the church and so on? And these are things that have caused divisions throughout the uh, uh, centuries among Christians. So, Friends do not deny that sacraments may be a benefit at times to those who practice them. I've known of people who have been baptized with water and it was very meaningful to them. I've participated myself in communion services with the elements and found some of them very meaningful. I found some of them not at all meaningful. What we do deny is the need to practice them. So the key word when it comes to Quaker practice and belief regarding the sacraments is need or necessity do we need to or is it necessary that we practice these uh, sacraments <laughs> you note in the scriptures you look at the old testament moving from the old testament to the new testament you'll note that the prophetic movement is from the external to the internal Jesus taught in Mark 7, verses 18 to 21, that what is important is the internal, not the external. He said it's what flows out of the heart of a person that makes that person clean or unclean, not the washing of hands and so on. Of the, the Pharisees, that's the context that, in which he talks about this. Going through certain rituals does not cleanse us. It's what the person is internally in the heart that makes us clean or unclean. And we also find that too much emphasis on the external tends to lead to neg negligence of more profound things. And uh, so emphasis on the external leads us away, I think, uh, often from the internal. I had an experience a few years ago. I was helping plant a church, a Hispanic church in the French Church Southwest. And the pastor that they brought on to found that church had a Assemblies of God background, so of course they practice baptism and they practice communion with the elements. And usually when they practice communion with the elements, I participated with them. And uh, uh, even though I typically as Quakers we don't do that. And they at at one point our pastor decided that he wanted to have a baptism service for new Christians, new believers. And so uh, he preached on that. He asked me. The Sunday, he asked me before the service if I would help him with the baptismal service. And I said, sure, I'm not opposed to doing that. Um, and so I just asked him what he wanted me to do. And, he, and my role was just to help dunk in the pool, dunk the people who were being baptized. So I said, sure, I'll be, I'll be glad to do that. So when he preached his sermon, his title was, Baptism is Not an Option, It's an Obligation. Well, after the service, I came to him and I said, you know what? I'm going to have to beg out. I'd, I'd like for you to find someone else to help with you, if you don't mind. And he said, sure, no problem. And so we did that. And I said, I'll, I'll, come, I'll explain to you later why I'm asking you to beg out. So a couple of days later, I met with him. And I said, 
I want you to know that the reason that I baked out is because I'm living in sin. And he said, what? I said, yeah, I'm living in sin. According to you, I'm living in sin because you said baptism is not an option. It's an obligation. And I've never been baptized with water. So you're telling me that I'm living in sin. Well, I don't remember exactly how he backpedaled, but he did, he did allow me to stay with him and help him in the church, and we're still close friends. Uh, again, I come back to the emphasis. The, the key word for friends is necessity. Do we need to practice these? Is there some reason? We, most Christians will agree that there's no need for baptism for salvation. There are certain denominations that insist on baptismal regeneration, by which they mean that you're not really a Christian unless you're baptized by water. And of course, the Mormons uh, believe that. In fact, they, they come up with a long list of genealogies so that not only living people can be baptized, but you can also be baptized for your ancestors in order that they can be saved as well. So the prophetic movement tends to be from the external to the internal. I, you, you may have guessed by now that I'm a fan of uh, D. L. Trubin. I like what he, his chapter about the sacraments. I think he has a very balanced approach to the sacraments. And I like what he says here. The sharing of a meal is something that makes spiritual communion more profound. And isn't that true? Don't we have a more profound communion when we get together for our, uh, our gatherings, our potlucks and so on as we eat together? around a common meal, but he also goes on to say it's not limited to bread and wine. Each common meal ought to be sacramental. Whenever we eat or drink, whatever the food, wherever it is, we ought to remember Christ's presence. We ought to recognize his presence in the common bread or common life. If we keep that in mind, and if we think of that as a practice, we actually practice the sacrament more often than many denominations. If we think of each common meal when we eat together and fellowship together as, as a sense of sharing uh, in the presence of Christ, then we are, in that sense, practicing some sort of communion with the elements. True Blood goes on to say, Quakers take so seriously the idea that our universe is sacramental that they cannot limit the notion to a ceremony or particular initiation. The water that washes children's clothes is just as sacred as the holy water that is blessed by a priest. How many sacraments are there? There are 70 times 7. In other words, all of our life is sacramental. The whole universe is sacramental. And so we don't divide between the common and the sacred in our understanding of, of life. So how do evangelical friends address the sacraments today? Well, if you go back to the 17th century, Isaac Pennington, one of the leaders of the early Quaker movement, believed that the true church does not have any outward ceremony because the true church does not have them, friends may not. In other words, Pennington insisted that we should not, must not, it wasn't just a matter of need or necessity, practice the, uh, the sacraments. So any yearly meeting that permits the ordinance takes itself outside the true faith. Now I'm quoting Pennington here. We might call this the uncompromising position. So this is from John Punchin's book, uh, citing Pennington. I actually had the experience of one of our leaders in Guatemala saying that to practice uh, the elements was a sin. And again, I was taken aback by that statement. That was in a Sunday school class that he taught. I happened to be there. And so I asked him after the, after the, uh, Sunday school service, I said, what are you talking about that it's a sin? Well, he said, we have the truth, so if we practice it, we're in sin. <laughs> well, that doesn't bode well for the other denominations that practice it. Friends have never believed that the other denominations are living in sin because they practice the elements. Again, we've never felt the need to do it ourselves, but we do not uh, con condemn or say that other denominations that do practice it are wrong, and except when they insist that it's necessary for salvation or as some means of grace. So Pennington's view was that Quakers are wrong to practice 
the sacraments with the elements, water baptism or uh, communion with the elements. Gurney's position was a more moderate position. It maintains the truth of Friends' claim that participation in the ordinance is unnecessary for salvation, but does not carry the implications other churches fall into error when they do observe the ordinances. The moderate position sees the outward ordinances as a diaphora, that is to say, as indifferent. It can be done or not done, doesn't matter. Ceremonies neither commanded nor forbidden by the word of God and scripture and open to each church to observe it as they see fit. So there are many friends today that do practice the sacraments to a certain extent. Many of our uh, friends' churches in Southwest, for instance, practice communion. Most of them practice it on uh, special occasions, not every Sunday, not once a month, not any kind of rigid schedule, but say Thanksgiving, uh, on Easter, Easter weekend. Typically, that's at least what Rose Drive Friends Church did. Uh, Rose Drive Friends Church, most of the years that I was there, did not practice that water baptism, but the last three or four years I was there did open it up to members. If they wanted to be baptized, then the option was there for them, but never insisted that they be baptized for church membership. So they would take Gurney's position, the moderate position, that uh, can do it. Actually, it's probably a little bit more like the next one I'm going to show you here. I get my arrow right here. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that one on there. Let me read it to you. This is uh, what Punchin calls the toler tolerationist position among friends, in that there may be circumstances in which it is permissible for friends' churches to baptize and observe the supper, and there are pastors who take this view. I'll repeat that. The tolerationist position among friends is that there may be circumstances in which it is permissible for friends to baptize and observe the supper, and there are pastors who take this view. My understanding of the mission field in India is that the, early on the missionaries began to practice water baptism, and there was a reason for that. The reason was not because they felt like Jesus commanded it. The reason was because they found that many Hindus if they became Christians, they often, uh, more often than not, suffered persecution, and there was a strong temptation to go back to their old way of life and to their old faith, unless there was some sort of public testimony in which they declared through water baptism that they were Christians. When they did that, there was no going back. Uh, their family would not accept them back. Their religion would not accept them back. They were considered outcasts at that point. So you can see the benefit in some circumstances to uh, practicing these ordinances. So those are the three, the three positions typically that we find in our churches today. Uh, in our Latin American churches, because they were taught that we don't practice baptism and communion, they're pretty strongly into uh, Pennington's position. In fact, when we did a revision of our faith and practice in Southwest, our Latin church members asked that the permission statement not be included in their version of faith and practice. In other words, that we permit baptism and communion, though we don't uh, encourage it. So I suppose probably, uh, maybe perhaps the majority, I'm not familiar with all your meetings. I know Eastern region has practiced baptism with water for a long time. I don't know about our other evangelical uh, uh, denomination, or I mean our other yearly meetings, how much they practice it, or your own local churches. Uh, many will take the Gurneyite position that we don't uh, think other churches fall into error by uh, practicing it. Uh, and often some of our churches take the tolerationist position that uh, if you feel like you want to practice it, that's up to you. So uh, it's time to take a break. Let me give you the opportunity before we do to ask any questions that you might want to ask about anything we've talked about tonight, going back to Christian perfection or our worship, form of worship, in our friends' meetings, including the sacraments. Shane, I'd like to ask. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Well, what you said, what you said about the uh, use of the sacraments in like India, in I understand that that is kind of a mix in Africa in our 
of issues in Africa that really insist on using water practices, and that some say no. And I wonder what the history of that is in the mission field. In in Burundi, in Burundi they do not practice water baptism, and I suppose they probably don't practice communion with the elements. So I can't say with any uh, confidence whether that's true or not. I I get my information from Brad Carpenter, who's a missionary in Rwanda, that in Burundi they do not practice baptism, and and the reason that that topic came up is because in Rwanda they do practice water baptism. And so I suppose that they probably practice communion with the elements. Again, I, I don't know that. So when the, uh, when the missionaries went into Rwanda, for some reason, they decided to go ahead and allow baptism with water. And, and the reason that that topic came up is because there's some talk about Burundi and Rwanda joining together in a joint mission outreach to other areas. But then there's a controversy over whether when they do that, if they do that joint mission, whether they ought to practice water baptism or not. The Burundians are opposed to it, and the Rwandans are in favor of it. So uh, we also have we also found that same thing happen in uh, in Cambodia. Evan Friends Church has a mission in Cambodia, and from the beginning, they decided to allow the churches to practice water baptism. Our Latin American uh, uh, some of our Latin American churches, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, formed a mission, and they sent a missionary couple, two missionary couples, to Guata to uh, Cambodia as well. And because they're so rigid, in those three year meetings in Latin America, they don't practice baptism in Cambodia either. We tried to join the two groups together. Alan Amaviska, our mission leader at the time, tried to join the two groups together, and that was a, a, a an impenetrable wall that didn't allow that to happen. So uh, it can still cause some controversy. Okay. Any other questions before we take a break? Yes, Gene, this is Barry Lawson. Okay, a little louder. I can't hear you very well. Okay, can you hear me a little better now? Uh, barely, but go ahead. Let me see if I can get it. Okay, I just okay. want to there. I want you to explain a little bit more about what the, the biblical meaning of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was that Paul had made reference to with the one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, mm -hmm. and how that is a, how that had happened how that, in, the, in the life of a, of a person that was born again. Yeah, let me. Let me say first of all that. Uh, one reason that second work of grace holiness people believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a second work of grace is because Jesus made a statement to his disciples in John that the Spirit is with you, he will be in you. And so when you come to the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And later on, uh, Peter said that this is what Jesus spoke about when he said, John baptized with water, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, those who taught the second work of grace said the disciples were already redeemed. They were already converted. And so this must be some sort of second work of grace when the baptism of the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And so they took that as a, as a second work of grace. Now, again, I'll, I refer to a study that I made. If you go through the book of Acts and you look at every time it talks about the, the Spirit uh, being the baptism of the Spirit or the Spirit coming on believers and so on, it uses different terminology, but it all seems to be the same experience. So if you go on into chapter 2, after the disciples had been filled with the Holy Spirit, then the, uh, the believers, the ones who came to faith that day when Peter preached his sermon, asked him, what should we do? And Peter responded and said, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So he's obviously talking to unbelievers who are, who are asking, how can they be saved? 
And then he goes on in that same context to say, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. So at least it says there that they received the Holy Spirit the day that they believed. And then uh, if you go over into uh, chapter 10, when Cornelius becomes a believer, it talks about the Holy Spirit came on them. The Holy Spirit was poured out on them when they believed. And so, so the terminology is baptism, receiving, Holy Spirit poured out on them, and so on. Which leads me to believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a is a, uh, a part of our redemption experience when we come to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then I mentioned also when I was talking that in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul, Paul says this, you, however, are not are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he, is, he does not belong to Christ. And again, that says to me that when a person becomes a follower of Christ, belongs to Christ, then he receives the Holy Spirit. So I take the terminology of baptism the Holy Spirit to mean that we receive the Holy Spirit when we uh, come to faith in Jesus. Now, let me just cite one more passage that ties, I think, again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in with redemption language. And that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Yeah. So Paul says there, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Remember, he, he describes these Corinthian Christians as carnal in chapter 3. But here he says, we were all, and I take that to mean all of the Corinthians, as well as Paul and his uh, followers, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all given that one spirit to drink. So when he says that we were all baptized by one spirit in one body, I think that's the spirit, that's what he's talking about when he says there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And then if you go on to, in that uh, uh, passage in Ephesians, then it goes out and expands that a little bit as well. Does that answer your question? Now, I'm not hearing you at all now. Do you have a muted? Jerry? Okay, how's that? Okay, there. Now you're on. Okay. That's my view is the fact that the the one Lord, one faith, one baptism is that that's spoken of by Paul in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that we are truly born again, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. By be truly, truly being born again, we are placed in the body of Christ. Uh, by the Holy Spirit, and, and it's called baptizing us into the body. Mm -hmm. by the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes, I would agree with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? These are good. Uh, these are good questions we're having. <coughs> Okay, let's take a break then. We'll come back and we're going to go on and talk about uh, a Quaker Peace testimony and another topic or two.
Yeah, let's just see. Okay, now I need to go to the other PowerPoint. Excuse me. And compare. I need to get my glasses. Hang on. Let's see if I can get it down here, Dave. There we go. Okay, now we're set. Okay, friends, let's pick it up again for a few minutes. What we've been talking about the last few minutes is the uh, Quaker distinction that was held through the centuries, not so much anymore in some of our churches. In fact, but I just mention one more thing. Some of our friends' churches, at least in Friends Church Southwest, are actually putting baptismals in their church, which, which rather surprised me. I, well, I don't need to say anything more about that. I just, <laughs> so let's uh, let's talk now about another distinctive that we find in uh, among friends. And that is the traditional Quaker view of war and peace, or vengeance is vengeance and war. Let me find a quote. No, this is uh, by um, well, I've got my papers all jumbled up here, so I don't think I'm going to find it. it Ah, here it is. Skipping ahead. Maybe I should keep it in order so you follow me in order and then we'll come to it. Okay. So traditionally, the friends were opposed to participating in the military or participating in war. And um, these are the reasons that have been given for that. Early, early Quakers were pacifists for these reasons. They believed that Christ prohibited avenging oneself. Matthew 5, 38, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And also we find in that same Sermon on the Mount that Christ commanded us to love our enemies. In Matthew 5, 44, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Paul tells us that our weapons are not carnal. Uh, we don't struggle against flesh and blood, but we, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we, we struggle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. James testifies that wars are a result of our carnal passions. So where do wars come from among us? They're a result of our passions. Uh, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not for this that your passions are at war within you? We find also that in the Old Testament, Isaiah and Micah both prophesied a time when there would be total peace. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4 says, He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So it was almost exactly the same quote in Micah chapter 4 and verse 3. When Christ was, was being questioned by Pilate, well, are you a king? Yes, I'm a king. But he said that his kingdom was not of this world. And uh, when Peter drew the sword and cut off the ear of the servant, Jesus actually rebuked him and <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, 
healed his ear, and then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And the Apostle Paul counseled Christians not to return evil for evil, not to take vengeance, and as much as possible to live in peace with one another in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 to 21, where he says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Um, Christ calls on his followers to carry their cross, not to crucify others. So, here's a quote that I was looking for. This is Rufus Jones, quoted in uh, by True Blood in his book, The People Called Quakers, in which he states, I'm only too conscious that only a tiny fraction of Christians in the world accept the position which I hold, and I feel humble about holding it in the face of the fact that the vast majority of Christians Excuse me, walk a different path from mine. <clears throat> I could say that same thing, and I could also say the same thing about uh, our position on the sacraments as well, baptism and, and uh, communion, that I'm very conscious that we're a tiny minority of those who do not practice them, and uh, it is a humbling thing to hold it in the face of, in the, face of the fact that the majority of Christians do practice and the majority of Christians are not considered pacifists. The Richmond Declaration says this, we feel bound explicitly to avow our unshaken persuasion that all war is utterly incompatible with the plain precepts of our divine Lord and lawgiver and the whole spirit of his gospel and that no plea of necessity or policy, however urgent or peculiar, can avail to release either uh, individuals or nations from, excuse me, uh, let me go back just a minute. Can, can avail to release either individuals or nations from this paramount allegiance, which they owe to him who has said, love your enemies. And I'm not, I won't read the whole quote, but it goes on there to uh, give the position of the Richmond Declaration of Faith. Well, this is another area where where friends have uh, become, I wouldn't call it a division, but difference of opinion concerning the peace testimony. I found that when I grew up in Iowa year in meeting, that was uh, emphasized quite a bit. And uh, we were taught in our camps and so on, the Quaker position on peace. I personally uh, registered as a conscientious objector during, during the Vietnam War and, and served in... Uh, uh, civilian service uh, for two years to fulfill my obligation when I was drafted. I have other friends who've done the same thing. I know pastors and, and friends here Southwest who actually served in the military. Uh, two of them were pilots in World War II. And of course, uh, there are others who, who uh, even today have served in the military. The Quaker position began to change to a certain extent during the Revolutionary War. That was a very testing time for those who practiced the peace testimony. Most Quakers did not participate in the Revolutionary War. As a result of that, many of them lost their property or, or uh, uh, left the country, went to Canada, and so on. But it was the Civil War that really uh, brought divisions among Quakers on this position of peace and, and war. Many young men joined the army and during uh, the Civil War, uh, but there were Quakers who maintained their peace testimony. And the same thing is true of the uh, First World War and the Second World War. The Quakers actually won the Nobel Peace Prize, the two organizations in, from World War I who uh, worked as, uh, uh, for peace and also as uh, medics and so on in the Army. So as a result of the Quakers through the years, insisting on the peace testimony. Our government allows people during the draft, it's not, a, it's not an issue now because of voluntary army, but during the draft, those who were Quakers, uh, members of the Brethren Church and members of the Mennonite Church were allowed to apply for conscientious objector status, usually with the obligation then to serve in some manner in a civilian uh, work ministry. During the Vietnam War, many uh, who are conscientious objectors, 
refused to even register for the draft and fled to Canada. And so Trueblood talks about that a little bit in his book. I, again, I'm going to quote some from D. Elton Trueblood. I appreciate his position in his chapter in uh, People Called Quaker. He entitles it The Struggle for Peace. Now, Dave tells me that Elton Trueblood's position on this chapter, The Struggle of Peace, is not the traditional Quaker point of view. But it seems to me that it's a, it's a pretty balanced point of view. And even as a conscientious objector, I like what he says about it. He notes that it's a very complex moral issue, especially in our day of nuclear weapons and ideologies like Marxism, jihadism, and other forms of oppression. He notes that sometimes moral issues are in conflict. For instance, war is a moral issue, but so is oppression by tyrants and dictators. The early Quakers directed themselves to personal attacks. This is not a question of when the victim is a third party. So what is the person's responsibility in a person is not threatened himself, but could save the life of a threatened person? I have a friend who's uh, so strongly in line with the early Quaker position of pacifism that he made a comment at one time that if his home were attacked by an armed person, that he wouldn't even try to protect his own family because he knows that they're saved and the armed intruder is not. And so he would not want to take that person's life and consign them to hell. I have a serious problem with that in my own mind, but that's his position. So Trubalad goes on to say, in our fallen world, it's not realistic to unilaterally eliminate our armies. In reality, the elim elimination of the army could contribute to war. Many, many, and many times the presence of an army detains or stifles invasions. So uh, I think there's some truth in that. But at the same time, he says, Quakers ought to maintain their testimony against wars because it's founded on Christian truth and the truth has to be declared. If not, the world will continue in the sphere of the second best governed by expediences that cannot hold the flood of evil. And so he goes on to say, even though we recognize that complete pacifism is not realistic right now, we have the right to recognize that we have a contribution to make to society. Because of its extreme position, it helps the state avoid the idea that war and preparation for war ought to be taken for granted. I, I think in this chapter, he might even use the word gadfly. We are gadflies, those of us who practice peace or are pacifists. And, and he's showing that there is another way, even though it doesn't seem realistic at this time, to uh, completely disarm a nation. So it's the responsibility of pacifist Quakers not only to oppose <coughs> wars, but also to search out imaginative ways to make peace. My good friend Alan Amaviska is, uh, is opposed to using the word pacifist because he says that just simply means that we don't participate in war. He prefers the, te the term peacemaker rather than to say I'm a pacifist, I'm a peacemaker. And that puts a positive spin on it. So that's something the way that Trublet is saying here as well. Uh, not only oppose war, but to search out imaginative ways to make peace. We ought to always be looking for ways to eliminate the occasion for all war, is a quote from George Fox. So again, this is a, a uh, distinction that early Quakers, early Quakers held. We find a mix among friends today their position about military service in the uh, uh, the uh, Friends Church Southwest Friends and, and uh, Faith and Practice, they mentioned that Quakers have traditionally been opposed to war, but they believe it's a matter of conscience. Conscience, and so if a person feels like they need to participate in the military as a service to the country, they have the freedom to do that without being disowned in any sense, word. Okay, one more topic that I'd like to touch on tonight, and that is women in ministry. This also uh, originally was a pretty, just pretty, uh, say pretty much of a distinction among friends. It's not, we're not necessarily in the minority anymore when it comes to this position, because many denominations now uh, 
have opened up the ministry, the pastorate to women in ministry. But there are also several denominations that believe that women can participate in ministry, but only to other women or to children, not to men, and particularly not to preach in a worship service. So what I want to share with you right now is what we call the biblical case for egalitarianism. Some of you are familiar, maybe most of you are familiar with the terms complementarianism and egalitarianism. The complementarians believe that wives are to be subject to their husbands. They have a specific role in the home and that's a, a role of subjection. And in the church, they are to be subjected to the elders and the pastors and not have any, any form of authority in the church so that women are not allowed to be elders in the churches that practice complementarianism, and uh, and again, not allowed to preach uh, to a mixed company, and not a, allowed to have any kind of authority over a man. Uh, so the yeah, egalitarianism is a position that women have the same privileges and rights as men um, in the church, and that allows them to be elders, and it also allows them to be pastors and preachers and teachers, uh, not just to children and women, but to a mixed group as well. The scripture, in the scripture, we find that, there's, that there are several women leaders who held position of authority equal to male leaders. Deborah was one of the judges, and she's not at all distinguished in her leadership from the male judges. <laughs> she did ask Barak to lead the army, but she was the one that, that, um, that led and made decisions in the, the, uh, among the people of Israel. Olda was a prophetess, and her prophecies to the king and the priest, both male, were held in the same authority as any male prophet. When the crisis arose, they went to her and asked her uh, what they should do. And so she gave her word of authority to the priest and the king, both of whom, as we said, were male. In the New Testament, you find Priscilla, and uh, it doesn't say that she had a leadership role, but you find her teaching uh, Apollos. If you read uh, first in uh, Acts chapter 18, Apollos was a very eloquent uh, disciple who came to Corinth when Aquila and Priscilla were there. And he began to teach. And uh, it says that he taught accurately from scriptures. But after he taught, it says that Priscilla and Aquila and it actually names her first, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and taught him more accurately the things about Jesus. And it's also interesting that when you find this couple mentioned in the New Testament, the majority of the time, Priscilla's name is mentioned first, and Aquila, her husband's name, is mentioned secondly. So that shows that she's not distinguished from her husband in the leadership role, she, along with her husband, Paul, ministered together and discipled Apollos. You have Phoebe in Romans chapter 16, verses 1 to 2. Paul mentions Phoebe, commends her to the church at Rome, calls her diakonos in Greek, which means deacon, sometimes translated as a minister or servant, but it's typically translated as deacon. And by the way, there's no feminine form of that word in the Greek. It is deacon, masculine form. And uh, Paul uses that term to refer to himself, to Timothy, and other leaders in the church. In Romans chapter 16, there are two names mentioned together, Junia, or most of yours, if not all of your versions, will have it written Junius with an S on the end, and Andronicus. <coughs> One scholar that I read recently said, everybody considered this a woman until sometime around the beginning of the 19th or 20th century when because they decided that women shouldn't be apostles. By the way, it says that Junia and Andronicus were outstanding among the apostles. So it's, it looks like Junia is identified by Paul as an apostle. One of the uh, early church leaders, Chrysostom, makes the comment, isn't it interesting that there was a woman among the apostles? So he at least believed that this was a woman and not a man. If you put the S on it, that's a man, Junius, 
If it's junia, it's a woman. And uh, by the way, in the Greek, the only difference is the difference of an accent, where the word is accented on whether it's masculine or feminine. But some scholars have shown that there was no masculine name, uh, Junius. So it probably was a woman. So you have these leaders in the church. You have Deborah, you have Ula, you have Priscilla, you have Phoebe, you have Junia. And then additionally, you have Philip's four daughters who are described as prophetesses in the book of Acts, chapter 21. Paul referenced several female co-laborers in chapter 16. If you go through chapter 16 of Romans, it's all, almost all uh, greetings to different people. Almost half of the people that he greets are women, and he calls several of them co-laborers with him. Jesus commanded Mary to tell the male disciples of his resurrection. And as one New Testament scholar points out, the women were last at the cross and first at the tomb. And that's interesting as well because typically in a court of law in Jesus' day, women were not allowed to testify or their testimony was not valid. Let's say it that way. So it's interesting that Jesus allowed the, the women disciples to be the first test uh, uh, witnesses of his resurrection. The Samaritan woman evangelized her town before all the men came out to be evangelized later on. And the following biblical doctrines show no hint of gender specificity. Women are created in God's image. In Genesis, it says that God created them. Let me find the passage here. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. So in that passage, you see that mankind is to share, both man and woman, in ruling over God's creation before sin entered into the picture. Both of them are recipients of God's grace. Chapter 3 of Galatians, verses 26 to 28, says this. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you who are... who as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now obviously Paul is not eliminating the distinctions, physical distinctions. What he's eliminating there is any kind of uh, superiority or preference when he says that there is no slave nor free, Jew or Greek, male or female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. So there's equality, and biblical teachings favor equality, as well as uh, showing that they all that they both have ministry. But you say, well, what about the passages where it talks about women being silent in church, or I don't allow a woman to teach, and so on? One Bible scholar has pointed out that in the uh, Bible, especially in the New Testament, you find three kinds of texts in the New Testament. And these three kinds of texts are instructive texts, illustrative texts, and corrective texts. As an illustration of an instructive text, you have, for instance, Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, where Peter quotes Joel 2, 28 to 32, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on them. And he says this, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on your sons and on your daughters. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So note that there's no distinction there between men and women on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and he says that both of them will prophesy. In Galatians chapter 3, 28, we just read this passage, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male nor female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And that's an instructive text. In other words, an instructive text is a text that applies to everyone for all time, 
and in all situations, showing that both men and women have been endued by the Holy Spirit to prophesy and that the word makes no distinction between male and female. Then there are illustrative texts. And the illustrative texts are those texts where it illustrates women actually serving in some sort of ministry. We've already mentioned Priscilla uh, further instructing uh, Apollos, and more accurately in the word of God. That's an illustration of her exercising ministry and to a man. We've also mentioned that Philip had four daughters who prophesied. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 5, where it's talking about the head covering and so on, it says, every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it's the same as if her head were shaven. Now, this is talking about their actions in a worship service. And Paul is saying then that it's all right for the women to prophesy in the worship service as long as she follows customs in having her head covered during that worship service. <laughs> then there are corrective texts. And the corrective texts, according to this biblical scholar, are those found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 to 34, and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. In 1 Corinthians 14.33, it says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And in all the churches are the saints. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but be in submission, as the law also says. And then in 1 Timothy 2.11, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. This scholar believes that these are corrective texts. If you look at the whole book of 1 Corinthians, every chapter, every section of that book is correcting some problem, some deficiency in the church. In chapters 1 to 4, there are divisions in the church. In chapter 5, some man is, is committing incest with his stepmother, apparently. In chapter 6, Christians are taking each other to court, and Paul is trying to correct that situation. In chapter 7, they've asked Paul about marriage. What do we do about marriage? What do we do if a husband leaves a wife? And so on. And so he's correcting those. And then chapters 8, 9, and 10, what about meat sacrificed to idols? Do we eat it? Do we not eat it? And so on. When you come to chapter 11, he's talking about the women and the head coverings and decorum and so on. And then in chapters 12, 13, and 14, he's talking about spiritual gifts. And in chapter 14 in particular, he's trying to correct abuses in the area of tongues and prophecy. And so when he says in chapter 14, verse 33, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Apparently, there was a lot of confusion in the worship services. It's also interesting if you look at the context of that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that it's not just women that he tells to be silent. If you back, go back a few verses, he says, if there's a prophet that stands up and prophesies, and then some other one, someone else has a word of prophecy, let the first one be quiet and sit down and let the second one prophesy. And then he talks about tongues. He said, if someone begins to speak in tongues and there's no interpreter, let him be quiet and not continue. And then he tells women to be quiet in certain circumstances. And so it seems that in this particular situation, Paul is trying to correct a chaotic situation in the church that doesn't correspond to the instructive text or the illustrative text, but something that, that needs to be corrected so that um, this chaotic situation is eliminated in the worship service. And the same thing is probably true in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Um, when he, he uh, tells women to be quiet, he means by that not to not talk, but to be quiet in spirit. In that same chapter, in the beginning of that chapter, he tells men to be quiet or still as well, and uh, so on, lift up holy hands, and so on. So in the instructive text, it's, there seems to be an equality among men and women in the area of prophecy, in the area of teaching, and we find that same thing supported in the illustrative text, and we find women actually carrying out different forms of ministry 
uh, that uh, in, in some cases also to men and teaching men as in the case of uh, Priscilla teaching Apollos. And so yeah, apparently the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2 seem to be corrective texts to correct situations that are not in keeping with the way the church should worship. Okay, that's what I have to share with you on friends theology. And uh, so now if you have some more questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Gene? Yes? I appreciate so much your uh, the last part here on the instructive text, the illustrative text, and corrective text. Uh, which are answering a lot of the confusion to me that has gone on within the church. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm rather proud myself that friends have always, from the very beginning, allowed women in ministry. I, I'm proud of that heritage. I think what you have done is <clears throat> talking about Paul with these quotations from Galatians, Romans, and Corinthians, I think you have interpreted correctly and provided a good alternative for those who have misinterpreted Paul, taken him out of context, and not given women their proper role in the ministry. I also think that as we um, consider Jesus and women, yes, it was the woman at the well who went out proclaiming, preaching Christ. Let me tell you about this person who told me everything I ever did. Mm -hmm. It was the women who found Jesus alive and went out and told the others. They were the first to be the public witnesses, the public speakers. So there's, there's with your correction of what is often misinterpreted with Paul, and with the realization that the women in Jesus' life were first among the preachers, it helps us realize that God created each one of us in God's own image in an equal way. Mm -hmm. So the, the historic Quaker position of equality has been explained to me tonight in terms that, um, in no uncertain terms, that women are called by God to be in ministry. Mm -hmm. And to deny that is to deny a person's calling from God. I've heard you say this. Have you said this in different ways, in a different way? I'm not sure. Probably. You know what I've said. My mind wandered, I have to admit that. <laughs> Say it again. Well, it was too long. <laughs> no, most of what you said, yeah, I found it. For just a minute there, my mind wandered. What do you think about these women that went out and proclaimed Jesus, oh. the first of the priests? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, it's, uh, they, uh, um, my mind uh, loses names nowadays. I can't remember, I can't recall names they slip out of my mind. Some of you may have the same experience, but New Testament scholar at, uh, at Asbury Theological Seminary is the one that points out that women were last at the cross and first at the tomb, and they're the ones that Jesus designated to be the first witnesses to the resurrection of the dead. And that's significant, I think. Those are the same people too. Yeah. They're and the women. The women, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what other 
What other comments or clarifications? We still have five minutes. Do any? Hey, this is Drew. I got a question from uh, here in Angleton. So Lori Heath, our, uh, our female pastor here at this church, had a good question, but she's making me ask it. So, um, who is who is who is the person? It's Lori Heath. Oh, hi, Lori. Hi. <laughs> she said hi. Uh, she's way in the back, um, and she doesn't want to get in front of the camera, I think. But uh, she had a good question. She wondered if, like, historically, maybe in the first uh, couple of centuries after Christ, is there any kind of uh, a record of uh, women in ministry at that time, and then, it, you know, it, it fell apart later, or, uh, I don't know, did I ask it right? Yeah. Yeah. Why was it such a radical thing in the 1600s that women couldn't? In the 1600s or the early church? Yeah, so we're just wondering if in the early church there's a record of, you know, women uh, preaching or teaching, and then, and then that got shut off at some point later. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I trying to think my church history. I know there there were women martyrs who bore witness and and died for their faith. Uh, women weren't highly educated, so you, you don't see them among the church fathers, because they wouldn't be called fathers, of course, but they weren't doing much writing. The church fathers were all the ones who were educated, and women were not, for the most part. Uh, pretty early in church life, the, uh, the monasteries begin to form, and so you have the, uh, the monks in male monasteries and women forming their own orders. But I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't recall any names, any particular names of women in the early centuries that were preaching. I did, I did forget one thing that I wanted to mention, though. And that is that when the Americans in the United States got involved in missions overseas, and from that time until the modern time, and that goes clear back to Carey, William Carey, in Britain as well. About two thirds of missionaries from the Western world to the mission field have been women. Almost two thirds. I did a little survey of our own mission in, in Central America, and that was pretty much true of our mission as well. Almost two thirds of our missionaries in Central America were women, many of them single women, of course. And so, uh, that's very telling. It's interesting too, a little bit ironic that a lot of a lot of churches that don't allow women elders and don't allow women preachers will allow women to be missionaries and preach the gospel to uh, other cultures, but not in their own. Great, thank you, Jean. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So uh, let me ask you, are, Drew, are you still there? Is it Drew? Is that right? Yeah. Did you say you're, that your pastor is a lady? Yes. Well, we are we have a rotation of uh, four different people that preach every Sunday. Okay. The pastor at uh, pastor at Emporium as well, I think, Charity? Charity. Charity. Yeah. I don't know. I think early on in mid-America... In Kansas, you're the meeting. I don't think the majority of pastors were women, but there were several women who were pastors in the early history of mid American year meeting. And the same thing is also true of California year meeting. There were quite a number of uh, women. I, I, I was in a meeting one time, and I think it was a free Methodist person, the lady who was a minister, a pastor. And uh, I made a comment to her that, that, uh, in the past, we had a lot more women ministers than we have now. And I said, I would think that in this age of feminism that you would have more women ministers. She said, well, actually, I think that's the reason we don't. I think people are reacting in their churches to the feminist movement. And so this, the pendulum has swung the other way. And that may be the case. I'm not sure. Okay. 
I see. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for being good listeners and for putting up with me for three sessions. Oh, wonderful job. Boy, you know, um, we just had we just had someone here say a wonderful job, Gene, and I would add mine to that. Um, oh. Oh, I would say we learned so much from Eugene about our beliefs, our history, our practices. They've been informative. They've been interesting. They've been rich in content. I thought I had read True Bloods, people called Quakers many times, but you picked out something that I had not remembered. I'd read it, but hadn't remembered it. So... Um, I think you've probably read Quaker history and memorized it all, but just a little bit you've forgotten. <laughs> so we're better for, we're much better equipped and prepared to do ministry as a result of this. And because of your cross cultural experience of having lived in a different culture, in a different in two different nations, right? Mostly in Guatemala. Mostly, but you live some in Costa Rica. One year. Yeah. So anyway, having lived in different cultures and different nations, uh, you have spoken to all of us who live cross-culturally in numerous nations that are listening to this in our world. And, um, and that's, that's a tribute to you. So we're grateful for that. Now, next month, that's one month from tonight, that's May 6th, that's the first Monday of May, Brocky Follett from Barclay College will be our teacher on family building. Just two years ago, she completed her Master of Arts degree in family ministries from Berkeley College, something that others of you might want to consider. So let's close this with a prayer to our eternal God. We leave here, O oh God, with our minds filled with new knowledge and with our hearts committed to provide the most faithful leadership of the church that we're able. We pray that you will pour out your spirit to each one of us so that we may glorify you through our lives and ministry in these forthcoming days of remembering your supreme sacrificial gift of love and grace in the horrific cruelty of the cross and in your almighty power unleash the greatest miracle, Christ's resurrection. In his holy name we give thanks, honor, and glory. Amen. So we'll see you all then on May 6th. It's been a wonderful three sessions. And we thank you again, G. Good night, friends. <laughs>